Now move to our very exciting panel discussion. We call it industry insights about uh, open banking. Uh, to conduct this uh, panel, we have uh, Aaron from AVP from TD. We have Michelle, uh, CEO uh, of Innovator, Joseph uh, CISO at uh, Sagard Holdings, and Stella, President uh, RM RMA Toronto Risk Management Associate Toronto Association Toronto. Um, so our panel agenda is like this. At the beginning, I will give uh, like <laughs> five minutes for our panelists to quickly talk about uh, some unique about themselves or some interesting things the, in their practice. Then we were about we have about thirty minutes to walk through some interesting questions. And also, I encourage people online to submit your questions. Uh, so I will try to pick up some of them to ask our panels. Then the last uh, two or three minutes, I just want to ask our panels to give some like a final thoughts or advice before we wrap up. All right. Uh, okay. Let's start our self introduction. Um, Michelle, you. Actually, my first on my screen. I, I guess a different people see different screen. You actually my first uh, on my first screen. That Aaron is the second, and Stella is third, and Joseph is fourth. So can we follow that order for for our self introduction? I guess there's an algorithm there. <laughs> All right, Michelle, you first. Yeah, I definitely did my intro already. I, I think it, it's just such a great discussion. And Brian, I'm not sure, but I do believe this is the first ever conference completely focused on open banking and cybersecurity. So I have to say it's been an honor helping put this together and working alongside you to open this discussion uh, to this group. And I'm going to pass it over to Aaron. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to be part of the panel, uh, including the, the presentations that we've seen so far. Um, I, I think it's important to be discussing security as it relates to open banking. Uh, it's an, an enabler to, to the innovation that comes with open banking. Um, and uh, a brief introduction for myself. So uh, I'm an AVP for cyber fraud at TD Bank. Uh, a large focus is on uh, account level attack uh, and responding uh, to, to any threat events uh, that might uh, compromise uh, our customers' data. Uh, so my focus is making sure that we can protect uh, customer accounts. And uh, that uh, gives me cause to work closely with uh, TD's open banking team, our broader digital team, uh, and Fusion Center partners, all in an effort to protect customers. Perfect. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Stella? Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, you know, I was actually uh, told by Michelle, who I participated in other open banking panel discussions with, um, you know, to, to join today. And I'm super excited because, you know, we have we have some uh, bank representation, which is usually very rare. <laughs> so we're very happy to see Aaron join us. You know, we have quite a, a different perspectives when it comes to open banking. Um, and so my background is in risk management. So I am the president of the Toronto chapter. And uh, basically the RMA stands to help uh, professionals, risk professionals develop their, um, you know, career. And so I'm going to kind of put the risk lens on today's topic, on today's conversation. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Stella. And Joseph? Um, hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, so, my name is Joseph Lau. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Cigar Holdings, and I'm also dual headed as a CISO for Portage Ventures. So, for those of you that are not familiar with Cigar, it's a multi uh, strategy alternative asset manager. So we invest in different asset classes like venture capital, venture building, private equity, um, private credit, um, healthcare royalties. So there's a lot um, there. Um, but I would say definitely one of my one of the best parts of my job is wearing my Portage hat and working directly with our fintech startups. Um, I spent over 19 years in the federal government at the Communication Security Establishment and the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity. Um, my last role prior to joining Cigar was as head of critical infrastructure, where I worked with like the large, large companies in Canada in telco, finance, energy, healthcare, and transportation partners uh, to improve their cybersecurity. So now, like wearing the the Portage hat, I get to work with really small companies, which is super exciting as well. Excellent. All right. So as you can see, our panelists are from uh, uh, they have uh, their unique perspective, but also they all have a. Uh, many years experience in this uh, industry and uh, their work also very related to open banking. So very excited to have this panel together and I hope to hear a lot of insights from you guys as well. 
So let's start uh, our first question. And uh, really is a very open and general questions. Uh, one of the Michelle's slides mentioned the opportunities, right? So, so before we, so that's a kind of thing. So whenever you, you, you pitch some new idea or new product, you want to see the benefits first. Why do you need that, right? So, so here, I'd like to hear your uh, perspective. What kind of opportunities for open banking and specifically in Canada? And uh, yeah, you can get whatever from your work or from your personal or from other insights or whatever area you can think about. Um, since Michelle already talked, so I will give the chances to Stella first. Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, you know, one of the things Michelle talked about in, in her presentation was the investments uh, that VCs do into fintechs. Um, I believe the numbers were um, in Canada in 2019, we had, they had invested two, 241 million uh, and then in the UK, 6 billion. So if you look at that opportunity, that is kind of a huge gap. Um, I think that, you know, we, we are now, especially during COVID time, you know, it's pushed us to kind of be more digitally um, abled. And so with open banking, that, that really would help. Um, FinTechs would really help pave the way. Um, so definitely for me, it's an opportunity for innovation, uh, competition, but yeah, thank you. Excellent. Innovation is very, very important. And, and uh, Joseph, uh, from your introduction, you, you actually are currently working with the investment firm and a lot of uh, innovation. So what do you see from your end? Uh, so what has me most excited about open banking in Canada is uh, when fintechs are able to provide financial services to help marginalized and underserved groups, which makes a really big impact on their lives. So I'd like to actually give an example from one of our portfolio companies, Coho, um, which is a Canadian ch uh, challenger bank. Um, so a friend of mine uh, went through some life and family changes and had to rebuild her credit score. Um, I recommended that she try the Coho Credit Builder service, and shortly after, she texted me telling me that she was like really, really happy that her credit score had gone up 13 points. So, in this context, we really need open banking and accessibility of computer uh, consumer financial data, data for these types of services to be widely available or, and at a reasonable cost. Um, I think so. If and I have friends at all the big five, big six banks and Desjardins. And, but if we look at the largest financial institution in Canada, they all have venture capital arms that are investing in fintech. And the real the question would be why, if they have so many resources. I, I believe it's because it's lower risk bet and starts are more agile and can really test out these theses if it makes sense or not. And however, at the same time, this type of innovation requires access to data. And if you look at, at our economy as an information economy, Really, data has become the new oil. Okay. All right. So you touch on the financial services, the data protection, and the data, the value of data. So from speaking from that angle, um, uh, Aaron, what do you see? Especially you from the banking industry, right? So, so what do you see there? Yeah. I mean, open banking we know brings a lot of innovative use cases uh, and use cases that consumers want, uh, and that's something that we can see at TD. Um, as you know, as we're going to talk about uh, the need to progress on open banking frameworks, um, we see where open banking is already occurring uh, and fintechs uh, enabling consumers. Michelle mentioned Wave, right? When you talk about enabling and empowering small to medium sized business to support them with, uh, with invoicing and accounting, uh, we see those types of use cases and many more um, where consumers want uh, access uh, to, to their data in different ways. And we want to make sure that we can uh, do that and enable that securely. Excellent. All right. So that's a benefit also for the large uh, large banking industry. And Michelle, uh, what kind of things you can add on that? Yeah, I love this discussion because it, it's really just an open view of many different perspectives of how you know many can win from this infrastructure. Um, I, I think it's just the opportunity. Right, Canada, I, I believe uh, where 30% of our GDP comes from financial services, we have so many Canadians that work within the banks and uh, pay tax and, and all of those different industries. And as we look to Asia and we see the mass growth and, you know, WeChat and Alipay and other organizations growing at a scale and a pace that, that we can't even fathom, um, that I think the opportunity is that if we can become a fast follower, um, 
and, and really understand the threat of the global arm race in front of us and actually put this to the top of the docket of Canadians as a, as a human right need the access to be able to share their data securely so that they can benefit from the most affordable financial services in a diverse manner. Maybe having TD, having Wellsimple, having Coho for different purposes, having, you know, different access uh, to WAVE and, and different services, which they're doing today. Um, but it can spur a whole new ecosystem of investment within Canada instead of companies leaving Canada. Uh, to the US and other markets for bigger opportunity and clear regulation like the UK. Excellent. Excellent. So, talk about the Canada, the uh, mutual catch up, and also not only for today, but also for the future. All right. And okay, so that's a great one. So, the why we, we now get a more insights about why do we need open banking? But uh, not everything is a perfect, right? So, not a, everything is a beautiful story. So, what uh, so if this is uh, so good, why don't we have it right now, right? So what 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 kind of challenges do you see at this moment? And uh, maybe Joseph, you start first. Sure. Um. So, uh, I would say like at a macro level, like we have the financial sector is entirely based on trust. So clients have to believe that the financial institutions they choose to work with will protect both their money and their information. So from a, a fintech perspective, like one of the biggest challenges to open banking is a perception that startups or fintechs don't have good cybersecurity, which actually is, is simply false. Um, hackers and fraudsters, they really don't care who they're stealing from. So if a fintech has poor cybersecurity, they won't be in business long because they'll lose all the money. So I like to use the example of like a new construction home. It's more energy efficient than a home that was built, let's say 50 years ago. And I see a lot of parallels between this and cybersecurity. So one of the major advantages for fintechs is that they don't have to deal with legacy systems, which are often not built with security in mind. Um, so it's much harder to bolt security onto an existing software platform. For startups, when, when their systems are carefully, and I'll emphasize the word carefully, deployed to the cloud with smart strategic cybersecurity investments, I really believe that they can be just as secure as the big banks and their agility can be a big advantage. So um, I, I know Michelle mentioned Wealthsimple, which is one of our companies a couple of times. So I'm gonna go back to them. Um, here's a real world example. Wealthsimple, um, working, I, and I was working with them at the time, they decided to roll out multi-factor authentication across their entire client base, which is actually over a million Canadians. And they were able to do this in less than three days with very, very minimal impact to their, um, to their client um, success team. So when we look at, at that, um, that, Implementing MFA has made their systems a lot more secure and it made it resilient to attacks such as um, credential stuffing or, or um, uh, various other types of attacks. So um, I, I think that we have to change the, the narrative and say that, like, let's work together, whether it's a fintech or one of the larger inc incumbent FIs, let's work together to, to keep Canadians safe and give them some choice and allow us to innovate as an economy. Okay. But I can see one of the major challenges from those uh, legacy systems, and because uh, uh, if you build like a, I like your uh, the, the story there. So if there's a old house, it's really hard to kind of make everything. You kind of need to patch a lot of things. So obviously that's a one of the major challenge. And Aaron, what do you see there? Yeah, one of the challenges from from my perspective um, is that. In a lot of ways, uh, open banking is here, but it's here without the frameworks that we're all talking about and describing that we need uh, that have security at the forefront. Uh, and so, um, you know, TD is making sure that we're at the table uh, in the industry, working with fintechs, working with financial aggregators, um, so that consumers uh, have uh, access to the data that they want. Um, and uh, the, a challenge right now is making sure that we can uh, do that effectively um, with security in mind first. Uh, and I think that that's why it's important uh, uh, that we play the role that we want to in the industry um, to, to put consumers security interests first and that we don't have a trade off between security and, and customer convenience. Okay. Security is a uh, number one concern actually. I know before even like uh, we start. So that's actually definitely the concern from uh, from the banks and also from a lot of fintech companies as well. Um, and a security by design, uh, as you also mentioned there. Okay, 
Uh, Michelle, what do you see there? Yeah, I, I, I see the challenges and, and first I'll say just a comment, I think against um, the current situation is when you look to the UK, um, there was a million UK citizens utilizing screen scraping and it forced the government to mandate open banking to protect the consumers and drive competition. Um, and I think right now almost hitting and, you know, I, I believe it's definitely over 4 million. I don't know what the number is. Um, having a secure API would help against cyber fraud uh, and different challenges. So I think the biggest challenge ahead is getting the government to understand the aspects of how this then protects not only the banks, not only the fintechs, but the consumers uh, in their data uh, portability, their data accessibility, and their data security. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges, especially being at the OBIC and trying to articulate. Um, we don't have, there's no budget in Canada to um, go educate the Canadian consumer on open banking, and nor do I think it's needed. What they really want is when they believe that they press that button to access WAVE, and it, they don't read the T's and C's like they never do for any functionality, they believe that the Canadian government, just like everything else, has protected them. And when they click that button to get access to that service, they don't realize that they're breaching their, their banking agreement with their current bank to access a service that's going to save them money. So I think the biggest challenge is trying to just share that point um, that there's already 4 million Canadians wanting and using open banking in an unsecure manner today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So education, you mentioned that education awareness also very important and the uh, upcoming some standards to replace the current insecure way to, to do that. Okay. Uh, Stella, what, what, what do you see there? The some yeah. challenges, you know, I, I think Michelle and, uh, you know, the uh, Aaron bring up a good point around kind of the narrative, um, as well as Joseph, right? So right now, currently, everyone thinks that open banking isn't, you know, a secure thing, but it's actually the opposite, right? The, currently, whenever you're using an open banking uh, functionality, you're breaking the, the terms and conditions you've signed up with your bank. So I think it'd be interesting from an education standpoint, but also from an FI standpoint to kind of also have uh, try to protect their own consumers, right? So, um, you know, again, just maybe changing the narrative and, and education piece is really important. Okay. So the narrative, the st I hear quite a lot of, uh, we need to have some like a standard or like a framework. Everybody agree on something like that, right? So, so that's actually I lead to our third questions. So I hear this term again, and again, open banking framework. And I think uh, at one of the presentation, we also mentioned the UK standard, like a, what's that? The payment standard, like a directive to something like that. And uh, there's a identity framework. So I'd like to ask our panel, what are some like a primary considerations? If we want, let's, let's say we build this uh, the open banking framework, what kind of major considerations we need to pay attention to? Uh, anyone can jump. Uh, I don't really need to call the name. Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, Joseph had in his presentation um, uh, FDX, uh, for example, um, and I think that there's a common agreement that we need. Uh, we need a framework that, again, puts security front and center, um, uh, user permissioned uh, data management um, so that uh, users can specify the the type uh, and, and granular level of detail for the data that they're sharing. Um, uh, as, as has been mentioned by colleagues, uh, the ability to revoke that access, understand how their data is being used, um, that there's um, a degree of assessment for participants um, so that there's a, a common assurance. Um, uh, you know, trust is, is important. That was referenced several times. Uh, and so having these things in place builds uh, consumer trust and uh, and really enables these these types of innovative solutions. Okay, wonderful. Uh, trust is a very uh, important in this uh, framework. Okay, uh, anyone want to share more? And uh, what what do you think about the open banking framework? I'll just quickly jump in. You know, security isn't my. Ex 
expertise by any any uh, measure. But one thing that I think would be really important to educating the consumer is the difference between what it looks like when they're using the screen scraping as well as you know an actual regulated framework. Um, the difference is is quite significant, and it's something that uh, Michelle and I have talked about. Kind of developing uh, the risks associated to open banking, right? What what does it mean to the consumer? Um, and and really working on the education piece because I don't think that it's very it's uh it's not something that a lot of people are aware of, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so basically it means the current way is uh, not secure. Basically, you have a lot of concerns and vulnerabilities, and it doesn't matter. It's a security or risk perspective. Uh, all right, so that that's a great aspect. And uh, Joseph, what what do you, oh, sorry, uh, Michelle. Yeah. yeah, I'll go quickly and I'll pass it to Joseph. But I, I think the other thing is, you know, we have to be careful not to run away from screen scraping till we have a secure infrastructure ready to, at play because of the amount of uh, these 4 million Canadians utilizing these services today. Uh, so, therefore, the urgency of making this framework. Um, and I think part of the framework is having Bill C-11 uh, pass on the floor. Uh, and if people hadn't heard of it, it, it's definitely like the, the next step for um, the PIPEDA Act, right? It's, it's kind of the consumer infrastructure of their rights. Um, and I, I think there's some challenges of getting a lot of political backing uh, at the moment. And, and it's concerning to me because it's really the first real framework step towards open banking and having something in writing from government that consumers have the right to share their data in a secure manner um, and just the update of that and how think of everybody who's ever been in marketing, right? We have some of the highest standards of protecting people from spam uh, and the fines are extremely high, um, but we don't have anything in place to protect your data uh, in the sense of how is it shared. It just seems like a, a step that is five years behind. Um, definitely from the rest of the world, and it, it definitely needs to be moving with greater pace, I would say, than it has uh, currently. It was proposed in November, I believe. Um, I don't know, Joseph, if you have any thoughts on, on that. Um, so, uh, I think, well, it's, 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 it is definitely very challenging in Canada for us to, uh, from a regulatory perspective and, and passing bills. Um, I think like people get hung up on on concepts or, or words like open banking versus consumer directed banking, and I, I don't really, honestly, I don't really don't really care what they call it. I think ultimately what we're talking about is we want consumers to be able to use their own financial information to get the best deals possible in terms of or the best financial services that meet their needs. Um, and I think this is another case where Canada has a lot of catching up to do. So. If we look uh, at the UK or, or the EU or even Australia, they've, they've adopted, they've already adopted open banking. And so I, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's a solved problem, but we can definitely be fast followers as, as you had said, Michelle, in terms of looking at their schemes and, 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 and taking the best of what has worked for them and using that to accelerate adoption in Canada. I, I feel that if, if we really care about um, in, in, in a Canadian context, building a robust economy, we really have to encourage this innovation and keep our Canadians at home in Canada doing great things. And this is one of the, the things that really bothers me um, as, as a patriotic Canadian. How many Canadians leave to go to Silicon Valley or, or to the US to work um, just because they feel that there's more opportunity there? So I see open banking as an accelerant um, that can allow Canadians to stay in Canada and build great companies. Uh, we have Shopify, we have well people, but I feel that there's so many smart people in Canada. Why can't we do more? Okay, that's yeah, I just want to make competition. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Stata. You know, to Joseph's point, you know, a lot of people are leaving uh, Canada, right? I don't know if you guys saw recently in the news, uh, Revolut decided to leave uh, Canada because. Um, you know, the, the regulatory structure was too difficult to penetrate for them. Um, and so they did, they did actually attempt to come. They did a pilot, I think, about two years ago, and now they, they just kind of walked away. There's been other uh, cases where we've had startups leave. I think North One was one. Um, you know, there's quite a few that just decide some fintechs that it's not worth it to, to try to make it work in Canada. And that's the unfortunate part. Part of the whole thing is that we're missing out on, you know, economic growth within Canada because the open banking framework hasn't been developed. 
Okay. All right. So up to now, we talk about some benefits, some exciting future. Also talk about challenges and also the the framework. And um, so before we wrap up, uh, we because uh, we can take forever to talk about uh, the issues, the things. But at the end of the day, really, is what can you do about it, right? So at the uh, the last question, I like to put to the in front of the panel is. Uh, what can we do now to get a better prepare for open banking? If this is a trend, is something coming uh, at like sometime in the future? So, what can we do now to get a better prepared for open banking in Canada? I'm gonna go to first. Yeah, yeah Vishal, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would say get involved. There's so many different ways between DIAC, uh, OBIC, um, going to your local. Um, you know, uh, just representative and sharing your thoughts, sending an email, sending a text, having some type of methodology to get the word out that, hey, 5 million people using open banking in Canada without regulation needs time for regulation. Um, and what we're trying to do at the OBIC is actually write a letter um, that says, I am a Canadian, I'm one of the 4 million, I'm currently using 10 different named fintechs, um, or I'm a small business, I'm utilizing these services to facilitate my business, I'd like to do it securely, just like people in Australia, just like people in Brazil, just like people in the UK, please facilitate a way for this to come across. Because I spoke to somebody in government, they basically told me, you know, you need 40,000 signatures for the movement to truly have momentum. Um, and I hope that's not the case, but I'm going to look for any angle to truly gather the ecosystem to try and benefit everyone involved uh, to try and get us there faster. Because without a decision today or tomorrow, this could be three to five years out, especially if the government does make a, an election in the fall. Um, and that should not dictate the future or the innovation of Canadians. This has to be a top docket discussion. It is now urgent. We are the last in the Commonwealth. The time is now. That's kind of where I sit from a positioning. So get involved. So we are behind. How can we catch up? And how can we raise our uh, voice to to push forward this initiative? All right. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on this? Yeah, I think really um, picking up on Michelle's point too. Uh, all the stakeholders um, participating, being engaged, uh, and and moving forward. Uh, I know certainly at, at TD. Um, we're, we're doing that. We want to be engaged um, with colleagues like the colleagues on this panel here and beyond the DIAC, et cetera, uh, and making sure that we can uh, enable these innovative use cases that our customers want and to do it securely. Excellent. Great. You hear the voice from uh, financial institutions. Excellent. Okay. Uh, uh, Stella or, or Joseph, who, who wants to sure. comment? Sure. So I'll, I'll just quickly jump in. You know, it's it's great from a uh, personal consumer standpoint. You know, pushing, trying to push your government to do something. But even if you, I don't know the demographic, uh, Brian, on on the call, but if you work for a financial institution, you know, I think it's important that you lobby within your or, own organization and. Uh, try to become a champion, right? I mean, having Aaron on the call is is a great thing, and you know, he's he's to me someone who's like a champion within his organization, right? Um, while he's trying to do the right thing by protecting the organization, he's also looking at it from the consumer standpoint. So, uh, I would suggest again, if you work for an FI, um, really try to get that conversation started because I think there's a lack of awareness. Um, so that's that's what I would recommend. Excellent. Which is also our forum, uh, like today, also needed, right? So to to raise that voice and awareness. Joseph, well, what do you view on this one? So I agree. We definitely need to keep the pressure on the federal government um, to move forward on open banking as quickly as possible. Like like we're already playing catch up, so um, it really is critical for that data to be available to enable that innovation. Um, I guess very selfishly, I'd encourage people to use our fintechs, uh, our Canadian fintechs for some of their financial services or be open to that. And then um, I think this is on an individual level. Level, I think uh, in order for us to be successful open banking, we also need better education and uh, better cyber hygiene for our uh, for the Canadian public. 
right? Very simple things like passwords. In fact, use a password manager. Um, use a VPN when you're on public Wi-Fi. And most importantly, really be aware of your online presence, whether it's on social media or, or LinkedIn or, or wherever. Um, as we move towards open banking, a lot of the risks around um, digital ID and so forth is the fact that we just openly give our information um, very freely to the entire world all the time. And it's really about being very deliberate and being very conscious of your online presence um, that I think that just very generally in Canada, we're not that great at. So um, that would be that would be my my recommendations on how to get prepared for open banking. Excellent. That's also very related to cyber attack and risk uh, the, the theme, because uh, we see security is a big concern. We have a great technology and all those emerging technologies coming, but the, also at the same time bring the new risk to to the to the landscape. So really, is how can you make the manage make the technology and the risk work together and ensure the security? So those are the major considerations. So we need to have. And uh, from my end, also, you also, you also mentioned the like, uh, identity and identity security is a foundation of a lot of things. That's also the reason we're putting together this uh, identity security summit in May. I would encourage you to take a look at that. We have a major players coming to, to, to talk about that topic. All right, so uh, we need to wrap up this panel and uh, great insights. And uh, I'd like to ask our panelists before we finish, uh, close this panel, What's your last uh, kind of a departure advice or final thoughts about open banking or something you really want to tell our audience? Uh, happy to jump in. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the one of the items for me is I don't I don't believe a lot of consumers realize that when they're participating in these items today, um, the the username and password is often stored uh, at a third party. Um, so uh, I'm really encouraged by the work that's being done in Canada. I agree with the colleagues here that it needs to move faster um, so that we can collectively take action to, to make sure that open banking is secure for consumers. Excellent. Manage the security as well. Okay, great. And uh, anyone want to share your last minute uh, advice? I, I think just the opportunity is real. Uh, the threat is real. Uh, and the risk is actually greater to do nothing than to do something. So um, by, by doing nothing, we're putting our whole financial ecosystem at threat um, by markets like Asia that have accelerated far faster than us and have moved vastly away from a lot of the infrastructure uh, and consumer behaviors that we have. Uh, they're, they're so far ahead um, that open banking is a step in the right direction for us to innovate for us to start competing. Um, and the risk of, of cybersecurity of open banking is, is actually, it's more secure. The risk lies in not facilitating it. Uh, we are the last in the Commonwealth, I'll say it. Um, and, and we can't wait much longer um, because the, the opportunity is now. Okay. That's so opportunity cost. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll build upon uh, Michelle's comments around the risks associated to not having open banking. Um, you know, from a strategic risk perspective, if you look at companies that don't move fast enough to innovate, they end up failing pretty quickly. Um, you, if you look at the difference between a uh, Fujifilm and, and a Kodak, it's it's very significant. Kodak didn't move fast enough to innovate and to, you know, kind of move with the, the times. And uh, Fujifilm, they moved away from doing the development of actual uh, pictures and actually moved more into the medical space, but they're still around, right? And so sometimes you have to look um, at what your, the missed op opportunities, right? So uh, from a growth strategy, you know, for large FIs, they need to look at this opportunity. They can partner with a lot of fintechs. Uh, they don't need to be direct competitors. I think that's also another piece that a lot of people don't talk enough about. You know, you can build upon your business and through fintechs. It's not necessarily a competition, right? Um, so, yeah. Excellent. And Joseph? Um, so, I, I guess I feel bad because no one mentioned COVID yet. So I think uh, the fact that we're actually doing this, <laughs> okay, go ahead. yeah, well, the fact that we're actually the fact the fact that we're actually doing this event as a remote event, um, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and 
open banking really can be accelerant. It can be a lever that we use to get out of this in terms of our recovery. Um, who knows how long this lasts? Probably at least several months more. But as Canada emerges from this, um, if we if we if we keep up the pressure on the government, we can definitely um, benefit from financial services um, from open banking. And that's that's really what I would I would try to leave as a, a parting thought is like let let's try to keep the pressure on the government so that we can actually use open banking as a, a way for us to uh, recover from this 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 crisis. Excellent. Yeah. So the pandemic actually. Uh, on one side, uh, actually accelerate the digital transformation and uh, bring the all kind of new opportunities, right? So uh, it's a time we have to catch up uh, and leverage the technology to make Canada like a not follower, we need to lead, right? So at, at least they need to catch up first, right? So try as a best as to lead that one. All right, so that's it uh, for the all. Uh, I think uh, we're right on time. And uh, again, thank you very much for our panelists for today. I, from your busy schedule, come to share your insights and uh, knowledge. And I like to ask everyone online and to give them a virtual applause or a virtual pat out there. So thank you very much for coming to share your insights.